The rain fell thick. In the middle of the pouring rain, Ji Yan and Jun were sprinting through the rain-soaked landscape. Ji Yan accidentally lets go of Jane Moon's letter and wants it back. But Jun reminds Ji Yan of their situation and says the letter was on the ground, so the ink might have spread and ruined it. Jun suggests they let it go. Ji Yan glances back at the letter he had dropped. The weight of longing and regret etched lines on his features. Despite the ache in his eyes, he understood his brother's practical advice and continued to run with him. Follow your brother and be safe, Ji Yan. Meanwhile, back in the palace, Jae Moon realizes it has been raining quite hard outside. Jae Moon sat quietly, lost in thought, with his head low and one hand covering half of his face. The crown prince had been thinking about something unsettling earlier. He wonders if it's because the schedule has been pushed back. He's trying to remember when he sent the previous letter, and he doesn't recall ever receiving a reply. As if on cue, one of his servants requests them to come in. Jae Moon allowed them inside his room. Jae Moon is aware that his brother has news for him, so he's anticipating that this servant might be the messenger. As the servant bowed, it confirmed his hunch. With two hands presenting the letter, the servant gives Jae Moon the message. Upon opening the letter, his face contorted with worry and surprise. The letter, sent to the crown prince, reveals that Wa Young Gun has received news from the man he loves, Jun, and that he couldn't help but inform the prince immediately. Fun fact, Gun is used moderately in formal occasions, such as weddings for young, unmarried males. There will be a night of rebellion for Jun and Ji Yeon's father. This is benefiting from the confusion. Shock registers vividly on Jae Moon's face as if time momentarily halts while he continues reading. According to the news, official Kwan was going to send someone to assassinate the king. It was only a matter of time until someone complained about the king. As the rain continued outside, Jae Moon wishes for his father to be safe in the middle of this rebellion. He knows what the rebellion will do, though, and that's to ruin the whole royal family. Punishment is quite fitting, but it's sad to see Jae Moon being caught between choosing his family and his people. Jae Moon burns the letter as his emotionless face is pressed against his hand, elbow resting on the desk. He vows not to overlook the unrest. Addressing the servant by his name, Jiang Xiao, Jae Moon cautions them and advises them to take care soon because the scent of blood will soon fill the air. Jiang Xiao, please help the prince when this time comes. On a night with no stars and the moon hidden by clouds, a group of men in all black outfits, their faces concealed in hair tightly bound in meat buns, sneaked onto the palace roof. Some of these men are very sneaky and manage to quietly subdue a few royal guards without being noticed. The men who are successfully clearing some of the royal guards navigate their way to the palace's double doors, swiftly open them, and welcome their comrades inside. Among them, a man stands proudly in the middle, his broad shoulders and tall frame commanding attention. Now in the middle of a tense standoff with drawn swords, the men in all-black attire assemble into a strategic formation and lock eyes with the royal guards who wore contrasting colored outfits. Jun wants to exchange a few words with his brother before the fight begins. He insists that Ji Yan must not risk his life, even if his swordsmanship is required for tonight's battle. Ji Yan reassures his brother that he wouldn't even think of doing that. Defying his brother's plea, Ji Yan adamantly refuses and pledges to fight alongside the others. Ji Yan, please, now is not the time for arguing. You're pregnant. Wide-eyed and fully turning his head away from the enemy, Jun turns toward Ji Yan and reminds his brother that any harm to him could have dire consequences. Before Jun can finish his warning, an arrow is hurled past the brothers, catching them off guard with its unexpected trajectory. It pierces through their uncle squarely in the chest. Jun's voice rings out in a cry for his fallen uncle, but this also makes him realize the gravity of the moment. Without hesitation, he takes charge, leading the men cloaked in black to rally everyone. In an instant, they charge towards the enemy, launching a swift and coordinated attack. Ji Yeon proves to be a skilled fighter as he engages the royal guards. Despite the chaos around him, he remains unharmed. In the middle of the fight, Ji Yeon's eyes land on something peculiar. Men are walking with their heads low, some with traumatized eyes and others deeply saddened. Ji Yeon is curious about the gathering, especially when there's one military official among them. Ji Yeon stealthily maneuvers behind the walking men, a shadow in their midst. The king should have more than one military official serving him, but he currently has one. His instincts tell him something is off about this arrangement. Ji Yan, remember what your brother told you. Don't do anything too risky. In the room these men entered, most of them are now swimming in their own blood. On a floor, a lone survivor pleads for mercy. 
There's only one person who is the culprit, wearing a menacing expression and brandishing a knife. They insist that the pleading man acknowledge official Quan as a king, asserting that those near death don't have much to say. Swiftly maneuvering behind, Ji Yian displays impressive swordsmanship as he skillfully dispatches the menacing figure with a single strike. Ji Yian's face contorts with anger and betrayal upon discovering that Zhang Xiao, the same person they trusted to deliver the letter to Jay Moon, is the traitor working under official Quan. Realizing the weight of the betrayal, Ji Yian's demeanor turns from rage to disappointment as he hears Zhang Xiao's remarks about the royal family. Despite being in a sticky situation right now, he also realizes he can't fault the prince for putting his trust in his instincts. Suddenly, Ji Yian feels an unexpected piercing sensation. As he turns, his eyes well up with tears because he knows the voice of his own lover. However, oblivious to Ji Yian's identity, Jae Moon wears an angry expression, convinced that the mysterious figure in black is a spy working for official Quan. There arose a significant confusion. Um no, is this how it'll end? In the middle of the night of bloodshed, the air crackles with tension. Jae Moon's face contorts with anger as he firmly believes he has caught the culprit. Meanwhile, Ji Yian couldn't believe this was happening to them. Tears stream down Ji Yian's cheeks as he slides his mask off. In an attempt to bridge the gap of misunderstanding, Ji Yian calls out to Jae Moon. The recognition in Jae Moon's immediate response is palpable as regret courses through his spine. Slowly turning around to face Jae Moon, Ji Yian immediately collapses onto his knees. Jae Moon catches him, his voice trembling as he struggles to accept that the person in front of him can't be his Ji Yian. Desperation sets in, and he yearns to call for a Wom to save Ji Yian. The Wom is a member of the court who cares for and tends to the king and his family at the palace. Despite his weakness, Ji Yian grasps Jae Moon's hand, revealing that he did all of this just to ensure Jae Moon's safety. With a feeble smile, he expresses happiness at seeing the prince again, even if only for a brief moment. Tears stream down Ji Yian and Jae Moon's faces as they cry uncontrollably. Jae Moon pleads with Ji Yian not to go. Blaming himself for the severity of Ji Yian's wounds, they share a tight hug on the ground. In the middle of their emotional exchange, Ji Yian reflects on the past, expressing gratitude for the dried persimmons Ji Moon gave him and acknowledging how to open his eyes. Ji Yian fondly looks back on their childhood and praises Ji Moon's manly and cool qualities even when they were still kids. Overwhelmed, Ji Moon cries out, begging Ji Yian to stop talking and keeps reassuring him that the wound isn't too bad and he will save him. Jae Moon gently cradles Ji Yian in his arms, placing Ji Yian's head on his shoulder. Despite his condition, Ji Yian smiles and declares that he still needs to keep his promise. Jae Moon pleads with Ji Yian not to mention the promise, but Ji Yian asks if he can have a shameful request for him. Jae Moon places Ji Yian's hand on his cheek, insisting he'll only listen if Ji Yian stays alive. In response to his plea, Ji Yian smiles and reassures Jae Moon not to blame himself, urging him to find happiness. That's not selfish at all. Ji Yian, even if you're suffering so much, all you think about is your precious prince. As Jae Moon hugs Ji Yian closely, burying his face in Ji Yian's neck, he questions why Ji Yian is doing this to him. Ji Yian's eyes start to close, and he apologizes to the prince for dozing off. Tears stream down Jae Moon's face as he urges Ji Yian to sleep early so that they can wake up early planning for the next day to be like any other, where they go to the mountains, play, and then rest. Despite waiting for Ji Yian's response, there is no reply. Jae Moon continues calling his name, desperately seeking a response, but Ji Yian remains unresponsive. Jae Moon's heart shatters with every word he speaks to the unconscious Ji Yian cradled in his arms. The realization hits him hard that sleep has fully claimed Ji Yian and he never got to respond. Vainly and coldly, Ji Yian seems to have left him behind now unreachable in a place Jae Moon can't reach. Gently, he holds Ji Yian's head close and contemplates how long this pain will endure and how long his heart will ache. Jae Moon expresses a desire for Ji Yian to live, even if it means it would be difficult. He struggles to understand why Ji Yian insists he shouldn't be blamed for what happened to him. Jae Moon remembers Ji Yian as a good and sweet person who always walked a lonely road. However, Jae Moon struggles to follow Ji Yian's plea not to blame himself because doing so might lead to forgetting Ji Yian. Jae Moon desperately clings to the memories, expressing his reluctance to forget Ji Yian. The fear of letting go of his beloved overwhelms him. Jae Moon persists in awaiting Ji Yian's response, but the deceased remains silent. 
Jay Moon dons an all-black hanbok with minimal design, his expression void of emotion and weighed down by misery. This is the year that lost its light, all due to him. Now, Jay Moon stands as a lonely dragon, emerging as the new sun for his nation. The term new sun implies only one possibility. He became the new king. Under the warm rays of the sun, the palace stands hall. Adorned in red handbox, Jun and his father, Ji Si Young, are summoned to stand before King Jae Moon. Donning such attire signifies that the Ji family is no longer in exile and has gained a favorable standing within the palace. Being straight to the point, Jae Moon announced that the reason he called them is related to Yeon. Despite holding a proper memorial service, as the anniversary approaches, he finds himself crying in his dreams. A suspicion lingers in Jae Moon's mind. He wonders if one of them is withholding a secret from him. Hearing this, Jun is visibly shocked. He already knows what was wrong. Unknown to Jae Moon, they have a child. Overcome with guilt, Jun drops to the ground, bowing low and seeking punishment from the king. Confused and a bit irritated, Jae Moon questions Jun's actions and what he could possibly be hiding from him. Unable to meet Jae Moon's gaze, Jun confesses that Ji Yeon was carrying their child. I'm sorry you've had to find out this way, your highness. In his room, Jae Moon is alone, clutching Ji Yeon's clothes, trembling and crying out loud. As he cries into Ji Yeon's clothes, he blames himself once more. The weight of self-blame for what he did to Ji Yeon has always been there, but now he grapples with the realization that he has also committed an unforgivable act towards their child. Desperation fills him as he desperately calls out Ji Yeon's name. The elderly dragon, who lost his mate, was tormented by loneliness and mourning. Jae Moon ascends the throne twenty years later. A tranquil scene unfolds under a bright, clear sky with a pond and small buildings nearby. A little child with a radiant smile joyfully calls out to the king. An elderly man kneels to the child's level, affectionately addressing them as Yule and praising their vibrant energy on this day. Whose kid is this? A man in a red handbok approaches the elder man and the child, bowing his head as he addresses the elder man as the king. He compares the king's body to Jade and advises him to be careful. The king laughs at being referred to as Jade, dismissing the man's concern as he focuses on Yule. He inquires if Yule has seen the apricot flower tree, and Yule happily confirms, mentioning that his father showed it to him. According to Yule, the big white flowers are super pretty. The king agrees, remarking that the apricot flower tree is as beautiful as a child. The other man present has red eyes and blonde hair, signifying that this is an older Wyom gun. Is Yule Wyum's kid? They're so adorable. Good genes never fail. Observing the king, Wyum Gun feels sadness, recognizing that the spirit of Yeon still lingers in the king's heart after all these years. Wyum Gun and the king engage in conversation, with Wyum Gun asking about the king's plans for the future. The king expresses his current desire for Yule to ascend the throne and inherit it, hoping that Yule's rule will bring him peace. Taken aback, Wyum Gun is surprised to hear the king's decision. Sadly, the king reveals that he has been longing for rest for a long time. Despite repeatedly washing his hands, the memory of Ji Yeon's blood lingers in his mind like a deep, dark shade of red mark permanently on his hands. However, the king notes that these days, the stain feels like it's fading. This gives him hope that he will be reunited with Ji Yeon. A bright smile graces his face at the thought of it. Honestly, Jae Moon reveals to his brother that there's not a lot of fight in him anymore. Sorrow is evident in Wa Young Gun's eyes as he feels sad in hearing his own brother speak in this manner. Since making Yule the next in line was his first request from Wa Young, he asks for another. He emphasizes that when he's gone, he wants the apricot flower tree to be taken care of. Jay Moon remembered the day he gave an apricot petal to Ji Yeon beneath the large and majestic apricot tree. Love filled the air starting from that day onwards. Jay Moon found himself unable to carry on without the unwavering support of his pillar. In the hospital room, the rhythmic beeping of machines echoed. Jay Moon's fingers started to move. Yeon began shedding tears as he comprehended the significance of the unfolding moment. Through his tearful emotion, he called out Jay Moon's name. Jay Moon, confined to his bed and with an oxygen mask on, exerted every effort to turn his gaze directly toward Yeon. Tears welled up as his eyes conveyed a sense of longing. Yeon called his name one more time. He's finally awake. Welcome back, your highness. As Jay Moon gradually wakes up, the voice he yearned for and missed so much fills the air. Before him stands the face he longed for, the one he always sought. Attempting to articulate Yeon's full name, tears stream down Jay Moon's face. Fragments of memories flood back. 
He recalls Yeon calling his name just before his head was struck. Images flash of Yeon tearfully pushing his hospital bed, surrounded by medical staff. Memories rewind the Joe Sion era when Yeon wore a bloody yet sincere smile for him. Only when Jae Moon opens his eyes does he become certain that these memories are truly his. Jae Moon feels an overwhelming sense of gratitude for the chance to be with his precious Ji Yeon again. In the hospital room, Jae Moon and Yeon lean toward each other and find themselves both in tears. Yeon expresses immense gratitude that Jae Moon is awake. Softly, Jae Moon uses his voice to apologize to Yeon. Jae Moon sits up, leaning on his bed, as the two lovers embrace each other. He continues to apologize profusely to Yeon, expressing regret for leaving him alone. However, Yeon reassures Jae Moon, stating that he wasn't alone during all this time. The response leaves Jae Moon in a state of confusion. Like the cold wind of realization hits him, Jae Moon sees the catch to having Yeon back in his life. Unfortunately for him, they have kids. Yeon introduces Jae Moon to their children. With green eyes and brown hair like Yeon, a boy in a yellow sweater cries while looking up at Jae Moon. His name is Ju Hyun. The girl in a blue sweater, the older twin, has short black hair like Jae Moon and intense red eyes resembling his. Her name is Ju Hae. They're direct copies of their parents. They're perfect. Jae Moon awkwardly carries Ju Hyun with a big smile on his face, in stark contrast to Ju Hyun trembling and crying in his arms. Mistakenly, Jae Moon calls Ju Hyun by the wrong name, Ju Hae, and introduces himself while complimenting how pretty his baby is. He's wrong but he's got the spirit. While holding the real Juhei in his arms, Yeon corrects Jae Moon by informing him that he's actually holding Ju Hyun, not Juhei. Jae Moon takes a quick pause, turning his head towards Yeon. Yeon points with his eyes and clarifies that he's holding Juhei. Jae Moon doesn't feel awkward or upset about getting it wrong. Instead, he wears a big smile and faces Juhei, apologizing for the mix-up. He points out that Juhei seems serious, almost like a general, which leads him to mistake her for Ju Hyun. Yeon playfully pinches Juhei's little cheeks, describing her as more like a bodhisattva. Despite appearing as if she would cry when pinched, Juhei remains unresponsive. Jae Moon holds the crying Juhei in his arms, drawing him close as he begins to understand the distinct personalities of his children. Despite having an admirable introduction with the kids, Jae Moon kindly asks Yeon if they could put the kids to bed so that they can have a little talk. Yeon readily agrees. Sam asleep. Juge lies peacefully on her back while Ju Hyun leans tenderly towards his sister, his tiny hand placed with utmost care on her chest. Lying side by side to each other, Jae Moon's arm is tenderly positioned under Yeon's head, and he lovingly caresses Yeon's hair. Their gaze meets, brimming with affection. Jae Moon notices something different about Yeon's hair. Curious, he asks if Yeon had a haircut, and Yeon admits that he cut his hair because he felt like he was losing his mind. Feeling a pang of guilt, Jae Moon wonders if Yeon had a difficult time giving birth to the kids while he was unconscious. Yeon confirms it, expressing that he endured the challenge. Overwhelmed by their emotions, they both start to cry and embrace each other in a hug. Yeon is crying profusely, feeling as though he can finally release all of the pent-up emotions that he has been holding in for so long. Through tears, Yeon expresses his deep fears, admitting that he was terrified at the thought of having to raise the kids without a father. He confesses that the constant fear of Jae Moon never waking up left him on edge, and the overwhelming longing for Jae Moon made him feel like he was on the brink of losing his sanity. He's been so strong and held it together for too long. I'm glad he has Jae Moon back in his arms now. Feeling a sense of guilt, Jae Moon tells Yeon that he can cry as much as he needs to. Apologizing sincerely, he acknowledges that he was gone for too long and promises not to be reckless like that again. Display a hint of frustration. Yeon scolds Jae Moon and warns him not to be that reckless or it might lead to a divorce. In response, Jae Moon pleads with Yeon not to say such things and repeats his promise. Recognizing that Yeon is still shaken up from the day's events, Jae Moon encourages him to relax and take it easy. Yeon admits that he doesn't want to sleep, fearing that he might wake up to discover that today was all just a dream. Wanting to reassure him, Jae Moon reassures Yeon that this is not a dream lifts his head, and tenderly kisses his Omega. Displaying their deep yearning for one another, the couple decides to ride the sheets. Jae Moon and Yi On embraced each other, savoring the sensation of being close after so long. Slowly but surely, their tough times transformed into moments of positivity. Despite being exhausted, Jae Moon still wants to hold Yi On because it makes him feel like he's back home after a long time. 
Yeon places their foreheads together and hugs Jay Moon, thanking him for coming back. Their smiles are big and spread across their faces, reflecting genuine happiness that radiates from deep within. This is so sweet. I hope this family can finally have a peaceful time together. It's the next morning, and the kids wear confused expressions as they observe the doctor scolding their parents. Jay Moon and Yeon appear gloomy, bowing apologetically to the doctor. The doctor acknowledges that this is the first instance of a patient surviving. However, it seems like they've been a bit too noisy in their room because complaints were coming from the emergency room next to them, so it's actually a good sign that Jay Moon is getting discharged today. Jay Moon and Yeon bow even lower, emphasizing the sincerity of their apology. Despite expressing their remorse, Jay Moon felt really happy at the idea of leaving the hospital. This is as if time greets him with open arms. Upon Jay Moon's return home, he resumes working out, learns to feed the kids, and enjoys sleeping together with his family. The children nestled in the middle while Yeon occupies the other side of the bed. Normalcy is gradually restored in their lives. Eventually, Jay Moon had to return to work. He stares at the three jade sides and wears a serious look on his face. Of course, there's still work that Jay Moon needs to tend to. Knocking on a door, Jay Moon announces that he'll come to his father's office. Jay Moon's father was pleasantly surprised that Jay Moon decided to visit him. Jay Moon's fingers delicately grasped the three jade sides, retrieving the dazzling gem that gleams. Jay Moon gently lays it on the table between himself and his father, a warm smile spreading across his father's face as he asks Jay Moon if he knows about everything now. Jay Moon nods and declares that he recalls everything, including the day he collapsed, the day before, and young means work. Jay Moon is glad that he can have his memories back, but he isn't happy about remembering what happened with Young Min that day. The day he received their family heirloom, the three jade sides, he began to build their family up. He remembers touching the heirloom that day, and thoughts of random but vivid events flashed through his head. Anger flooded Jay Moon's entire body as he remembered his stranger dying in his arms, recalling that he had once given this same person an apricot petal as a gift, only to witness them perish before him. The dying person had urged him not to blame himself, on that day, when these thoughts overwhelmed him, it became too much for Jay Moon, eventually causing him to pass out. So this is how he lost his memories. Jay Moon explains that he fell and hit his head hard on a nearby table. Because of his father, he remained unaware of what happened that day. His father smiles and reveals the truth. Jay Moon was deeply upset because of Young Min's actions, leading his mother to cry for him when he lost consciousness. The entire family was concerned. Upon discovering that Jay Moon fell when he touched the authentic three jade sides, they realize the gem he now possesses doesn't compare in brightness to the real trilogy. So, his parents attempted to create an imitation as close to the original trilogy as possible. Jay Moon reassures his father that he's fine now. His father mentions that Jay Moon must be curious about the whereabouts of the real trilogy and expresses a willingness to show it to him. Leaving Jay Moon in a dim room, Jay Moon eagerly opens the box and his eyes widen as he beholds the three jade sides. The trilogy sparkles with breathtaking beauty. With a tender touch, Jay Moon delicately retrieves the trilogy, pressing a gentle kiss upon its surface. In a heartfelt vow, he promises to reunite the precious gem with its rightful owner. Jay Moon arrives home, and in the kitchen, Yeon warmly greets him. Reminiscent of an apricot flower petal drifting down on a spring day, Jay Moon approaches him slowly and marks their eventual reunion. Jay Moon happily presents a box to Yeon, who appears a bit puzzled. As Jay Moon opens the box, Yeon gazes downward and suddenly overcome with emotion, tears begin to well up. With just a touch, the trilogy acts as a catalyst for unlocking a flood of memories from the past that swiftly and vividly flash through Yeon's mind. He remembers Jay Moon as a prince, recalling the heartfelt letters they exchanged. The vivid recollection takes him back to a spring day beneath an apricot tree when Jay Moon gave him an apricot petal. However, the tone shifts as Yi on recalls the summer night when Jay Moon, in a mistaken identity, and believed him to be a spy. The memory is etched with pain as Yi on remembers Jay Moon weeping for him, cradling his injured body. The tears persist, an unspoken connection between Yi on and Jay Moon, as both find themselves overwhelmed with the memories coming back to them. The reunion of Jay Moon and Yi on after years of separation and the haunting memory is a bittersweet symphony. At least they get to be together again. Tears well in Yeon's eyes as he tearfully addresses Jay Moon as your highness. In a sorrowful embrace, the lovers hold each other tightly. The weight of Yeon's words hits Jay Moon, who can't fathom that Yeon is using that title again. Overwhelmed with guilt, Yeon breaks down and questions how Jay Moon endured a painful existence without him. 
He can't bear the thought of his mate, his prince, enduring such suffering after their shared trauma. Jae Moon holds Yi on even closer, unable to respond as he repeatedly calls out Yi On's name. In their tight embrace, the two find comfort in each other's arms. At this moment, they are brimming with joy. Witnessing the couple's emotional moment is so moving that it brings tears to my eyes. In the middle of the day, there stands a house enveloped in beautiful greenery. Clad in warm attire, Jae Moon and Yi On walk hand in hand. Expressing a wish for the kids to be with them, Yi On receives reassurance from Jae Moon. The children are happily playing at their grandma's house, dressed as yellow sharks. Jae Moon explains that bringing them along might make Ju Hyun cry. Guiding Yi On carefully around the area, Jae Moon hints at another surprise. Is Jae Moon showing Yi On around their new place? It's beautiful. Eager with excitement, he covers Yi On's eyes with a blindfold and leads him to the undisclosed location. Despite Jae Moon's animated tone, Yi On is left guessing as to what the prince was so excited for him to see. Finally, Jae Moon stops them at a specific spot, urging Yi On to open his eyes and discover the awaited surprise. With great anticipation, Yi On removes the blindfold, revealing his old home from the Joseon era. Nostalgia floods in as he takes in every detail. There were dividers adorned with handwritten messages, traditional cabinets, and ceilings and floors crafted in the classic style of that era. As Yi On explores the house, his gaze falls upon a closed window. Upon opening it, the aged frame emits a soft creak. To his surprise, Jae Moon stands outside, holding vibrant red flowers. This is just like when Jae Moon came through his window during his manifestation. They're really reliving the old days. Your Highness is so romantic. Yeon's eyes fill with tears as he looks at Jae Moon. With a smile, Jae Moon reflects on their journey, expressing gratitude for reaching this moment. Vowing to include and cherish their past and present lives, Jae Moon promises never to lose Yeon again. Extending a hand, Jae Moon earnestly asks Yeon to marry him. Overcome with emotion, Yeon beams brightly after a tearful moment and agrees to marry Jae Moon over and over again. In an intimate embrace, the two confess their enduring love, rubbing their heads together in blissful unity. Immersed in their own world, they find comfort and happiness. Finally, under the swaying apricot flower tree, the dragon and the pearl come together once again. The dragon has finally found his source of strength. I'm really happy that these two are finally getting the happy ending they deserved. I wonder what's the next chapter of their lives. Within a bustling coffee shop in the middle of the morning, Jae Moon and Young Min occupy a table, sitting across from each other. Jae Moon wears a serious expression as he gazes at his cousin. Meanwhile, Young Min avoids meeting Jae Moon's eyes and keeps his gaze lowered and his body tense. What are they going to talk about? So many things have happened between these two already. It's hard to keep track. Jae Moon firmly insists that Young Min explain everything that occurred during the time he was unconscious, starting from the very beginning. Young Min takes a sip from his drink, gaining enough energy to begin talking. He warns Jae Moon not to be shocked by what he's about to reveal. Jae Moon mentions hearing about his lover's depression from Yi on himself, but insists there must be more to the story. He's determined to know the full picture. Surprised by Jae Moon's attention to detail, Young Min pleads for Jae Moon not to share what he's about to say. Frustrated. Young Min promised himself not to reveal this secret, but he knew what had to be done. With his head in his hands, Young Min shares that something unfortunate happened when Yeon was around seven months pregnant. Oh no, our Yeon can't take a break even for a minute. Young Min discloses that Yeon nearly had a miscarriage. Jae Moo's body trembles upon hearing this. He is left utterly stunned and struggles to believe the painful revelation. Still avoiding Jae Moon's gaze, Young Min continues, revealing that on that fateful day, Yeon's pheromones were messed up. Young Min became concerned about him and gave him some medication that his doctor had prescribed. Yeon didn't look good that day. Young Min could clearly remember Yeon faking a smile when he thanked him for the medication. He goes on to explain that, upon leaving the house, he felt uneasy and returned after 20 minutes to check on Yeon again. As Young Min continues talking, Jae Moon clutches his head in disbelief while his body trembles. The realization hits him hard. While he lay unconscious in the hospital bed, his own bed endured a lot of pain. Young Min reveals that when he arrived, Yeon's condition was critical. He had lost a significant amount of blood, and his blood pressure was dangerously low. Recognizing the urgency, Young Min called Secretary Kong for assistance and felt really scared at that moment. He thinks of Jae Moon as his brother, so he has to take care of his family while also adding that he doesn't want to lose his niece and nephew. Jae Moon is visibly shaken. Slumping his shoulders, his head and body hunched over the table. 
He anxiously asks Young Min if there's more to the story. Young Min knew it was bad for Jae Moon's well being if Jae Moon kept asking for more bad news. Understanding the toll this could take on Jae Moon, Young Min reassures him that the ordeal ended there. Everything was fine after that. Seeing how Hyun and the twins were healthy when Jae Moon woke up, everything did go well. Thank God. As Young Min speaks, he observes Jae Moon gradually calming down. However, he can't shake the memories of what happened that day with Yeon in the hospital. Yeon lay on a hospital bed connected to an IV, while Young Min sat beside him. He covered half of his face, tears streaming down, deeply worried about the well-being of their children. Overwhelmed by exhaustion, he cried uncontrollably, expressing that he was tired already, and asked for a comforting hug from Young Min. Young Min rose and enveloped him in a tight embrace. Yeon sat up and clung to Young Min for comfort. Young Min gently insisted that Yeon must stay in the hospital next to Jae Moon until the birth. Young Min reassured Yeon that everything would be all right. He urged Yeon to rest and not overexert himself, reminding him to stay strong for the kids, Jae Moon, and himself. In a calmer demeanor, Yeon quietly agreed. Young Min recalls Yeon expressing gratitude for him being there, who was convinced that he might not have survived if not for Young Min. Reflecting on the hospital atmosphere, Young Min finds it amusing how some people cry in hospitals while others provide comfort and cheer. He also finds it amusing that Jae Moon brags about his kids while also being shaken up by the past. Don't be a bully, Young Min. Let the man have his moment. Jae Moon is sobbing into a tissue, repeatedly calling out Yeon's name, while Young Min silently watches him. Young Min feels a deep sense of relief that everything's fine now. Young Min sighs in relief. He then shares that he cut the twins' umbilical cord and asks Jae Moon if he understands the significance. Visibly saddened, Jae Moon acknowledges what his cousin is trying to say. He had hoped rehabilitation would solve everything, but it hasn't made a difference for him. He carries a heavy guilt, feeling he hasn't done anything right for Yeon, just as in the past. Jae Moon vividly recalls the night when Yeon, still a soldier, fell into his arms. The memory makes him grit his teeth in frustration. Somewhat dazed by Jae Moon's monologue, Young Min offers him a new tissue, advising him to wipe away his tears and head home to Yeon, who will undoubtedly be waiting for him. He humorously points out that Jae Moon's eyes will likely be red. Seeking guidance, Jae Moon asks Young Min what you should do for Yeon. Young Min smiles, admitting he doesn't have a clear answer for that, and encourages Jae Moon to trust his instincts and not be nervous about it. Wise words, Young Min, this Wayman arc suits you very well. Jae Moon's expression brightens, he smiles, agreeing with Young Min's sentiments and agreeing to the fact that he might be nervous. Arriving home, Jae Moon wears a smile as he gently peeks into the room where Yeon and the twins are sleeping. It seems like they were in the middle of playing, and all three of them had peacefully dozed off on the playmat. Jae Moon takes a moment to pick up some toys and books scattered on the floor, tidying up the room. He then carefully lifts the twins away from Yeon. Surprisingly, they remain peacefully asleep, not waking up or crying as their daddy picks them up. Look at them being so tiny next to their dad. Carefully lifting Yeon, Jae Moon transfers him to their bed. Yeon wakes up, feeling the bed beneath him, and acknowledges his lover's return home. Yawning, he asks Jae Moon about his day with Young Min. Jae Moon reassures him that everything went well. Feeling all the love of the world, they share a tender and affectionate kiss. Sensing Jae Moon's cold hands, Yeon comments on the chilly weather outside. Suddenly, his attention shifts as he recalls watching a historical drama on TV. He chuckles as he shares that Joo Hyun called him mother, finding it adorable. Yeon also mentions their daughter, Joo Hae, enjoying tangerines earlier. Yeon's bright smile captures Jae Moon's attention. He acknowledged what his lover was trying to tell him, but he couldn't stop kissing Yeon. Jae Moon draws Yeon close to him. He's aware of his deliberate pace when embracing his lover, in the middle of their intimate moment, he confesses his love for Yeon. Feeling the warmth of Jae Moon's words, Yeon hugs him back and tells him he loves him too. Their hearts beat loudly at the same time. At that moment, Jae Moon makes a heartfelt promise, vowing not to break whatever they have ever again. Everything worked out for them. Everyone's healthy and happy. I hope it stays that way. It was morning, and Jae Moon was settled in his office at the Jam Art Gallery. On Jae Moon's desk, a monitor, a calendar, and a framed picture of Yeon's smile provide a personal touch. Jae Moon notices that it is already October, marking this day as 11 months since that incident with Jo Myung. As Jae Moon looks back at the unsettling memory, he recalls Jo Myung's menacing smile as he warned him to handle things carefully. 
The Alpha maintains a smile while openly expressing that the mere thought of Zhang Miang infuriates him. We have the same sentiments, your highness. A knock on the door abruptly stops Jie Mu's train of thought. The person on the other side introduces himself as Secretary Kong and asks if he could enter Jie Moon's office, which Jie Moon grants permission to. Without wasting time, Secretary Kong presents Jie Moon with reports and updates on meetings and legal matters. He highlights accusations of serious crimes against an individual during Jae Moon's absence. Jae Moon expresses satisfaction and strongly emphasizes that the accused individual should remain in jail until the end of their days. After tapping on the printed report, Jae Moon commends Secretary Kong for his work and praises him for a job well done. He dismisses Secretary Kong, who bows and promptly exits the office. Feeling the stress of his current work, Jae Moon cracks his neck as a physical response. Jae Moon thought of the Joseon dynasty era and how he had dealt with these particular individuals before, where he could just cut certain parts of their bodies. He wonders why there are so many awful people who take living and breathing for granted in the 21st century. Suddenly, an idea strikes him. How did that prompt an idea, Jae Moon? What do you have in mind? Yo knocks on Jae Moon's office door and announces his arrival. Upon entering, he discovers the office empty, prompting him to wonder why no one is around. Lost in his thoughts, he fails to notice someone sneaking up behind him. Yeon lets out a scream of surprise as someone hugs him from behind. In the aftermath of the surprise, Yeon's face reflects a blend of confusion and flustered emotions. Yet, he finds joy in discovering Jae Moon, happily rubbing his face against his own. Yeon reminds Jae Moon that he scared him and questions why Jae Moon didn't say anything when Yeon went into the office. The Alpha can only giggle in response. Yeon pushes the Alpha's face away, demanding that he should make it up for scaring him. That doesn't push Jae Moon away. In fact, he happily asks Yeon if he really wants him to make things right. Yeon reminds him to stay professional since they are in the office. Jae Moon declares that it's his office, and they can do whatever they want. He then proceeds to ask Yeon if he wants foreign food for dinner, and mentions that his mom will take care of the twins today. Oh, it looks like Jae Moon made plans already before asking Yeon. Turning to face Jae Moon, Yeon looks pleasantly surprised and questions if it's okay for Jae Moon's mom to take care of the kids so frequently. Jae Moon reassures him, explaining that his mom doesn't mind at all, and this is all because she finds joy in having the kids being cute and sleeping next to them. Still uncertain, Yeon places a hand under his chin and looks unconvinced by the Alpha's words. However, the idea of having a quiet dinner alone with foreign food seems appealing. Jae Moon was very proud of himself for convincing his Omega. Jae Moon reminds Yeon that his mom is genuinely okay with looking after the kids. He takes Yeon's hand, placing it over his own, and suggests that they could buy some fruits his mother likes on their way to pick up the kids. A kiss on Yeon's hand causes the Omega to blush. With a beaming smile, Jae Moon proposes that if Yeon agrees to the plan, he should seal it with a kiss. Yeon playfully gets grumpy, thinking his lover is being cheap, especially when Jae Moon is well aware of his good looks. How could you say no to that face, Yeon? Yeon maintains a grumpy expression as he requests Jae Moon to stop laughing and quickly close his eyes. Jae Moon wears a smirk, agreeing to comply with Yeon's request. The lovers then share a sweet kiss, with Yeon's small hand resting on Jae Moon's broad chest. Yeon asks Jae Moon where they are going to eat. Jae Moon happily responds that they're heading to a restaurant he used to frequent when he avoided working overtime back when they weren't in a relationship. Yeon instantly recognizes it as a familiar Korean restaurant. While discussing where to eat, Yeon could not help but get frustrated about his lover's fixation with a certain part of his body. Yeon asked him to cut it out, and Jae Moon only justified himself by saying that he couldn't stop himself. He then switched the conversation by asking Yeon if he's been overdoing it lately. Yeon wears an angry expression as he brings up the issue of not stopping because of the tangerine boxes at home. He scolds Jae Moon and reminds him that he knew he was busy with work, and Jae Moon had promised not to pack the tangerines all by himself but he still touched the boxes anyway. This is a bit bittersweet, but Jae Moon buys them in boxes so he won't have to go out if Yeon wants tangerines. He's afraid that someone might kidnap Yeon again. Sulking. Jae Moon explains that he made tangerine jam, tangerine juice, tangerine peel chocolate, and tangerine pasta, all while looking like a kicked puppy. Despite Jae Moon's efforts, Yeon points out that there are still three boxes left at home and letting them rot is a waste. Continuing to sulk, Jae Moon warns Yeon that he'll regret it because his body has been in tip-top shape lately. Yeon admits that looking at Jae Moon energizes him in the morning. I mean, who wouldn't want that view when you wake up? 
This still didn't win the Omega over, though. When Yeon tries to slide away from Jay Moon's embrace, Jay Moon stops him, holding his hand and looking directly into his face, playfully thinking of Yeon being cute. Jay Moon insists that just because Yeon got fussy, there will be three new boxes of tangerines. Unhappy with the idea, Yeon swiftly leaves the office, agreeing to the arrangement but refusing to talk to Jay Moon. I love how there's character development, but there's just that one thing that didn't change about Yeon. Jay Moon sighs and promises to do something about Yeon before even touching the boxes. The cat can bite. Your Highness, you have to be careful. Yeon and Jay Moon arrive at the traditional Korean restaurant and the food is promptly served. Amidst the meal, Jay Moon happily reminisces about the approaching birthdays of the twins. Yeon notes that October 2 is nearing. And with October 20 not far off, they should start planning a party. Jay Moon turns to Yeon, seeking input on how they should organize it. He contemplates between a dim hall or a royal hall. Aware of birthday party trends these days, Yeon suggests having a themed celebration and proposes a shark-themed birthday. The twin is in yellow shark onesies again. My heart cannot handle such cuteness. Jay Moon leans towards dim halls for a playful atmosphere with the option of having a garden. Yeon expressed that the idea is adorable, but it might become a bit chaotic. While still in the middle of dinner, Yeon sips water peacefully. Suddenly, Jay Moon's demeanor shifts, and he genuinely asks Yeon if they should have another child. Already, Jay Moon, Yeon chokes on his water and accidentally spits it out into his glass. Quickly setting the glass down, he starts stuttering and questions if Jay Moon has lost his mind. Yeon has never considered having another baby yet. Wearing a smile, Jay Moon reassures Yeon that he is just joking. Yeon's entire demeanor undergoes a drastic change as he repeats Jay Moon's words about it being only a joke. Promptly standing up, he wears his coat and gives Jay Moon a frightening smile. Yeon then asks Jay Moon if they could separate their jokes and serious topics from now on and demands that they go home immediately because he's tired. Unable to comprehend this sudden shift in mood, Jay Moon is eager to explain to Yeon that he didn't mean it that way. However, he finds himself at a loss for words. Oh no, are you going to sleep on the sofa tonight, Jay Moon? The sun peeks through the curtains, signaling the start of the day. Jay Moon wakes up to the ringing of his alarm, turns it off, and rises from bed while Yeon continues to sleep. Before leaving the bed, he plants a gentle kiss on his sleeping lover. Jay Moon fulfills his dad's duties by brushing Ju Hei's teeth, and his daughter doesn't make a fuss. Meanwhile, Ju Hyun kindly asks if Jay Moon can brush his teeth, too. Jay Moon patiently informs Ju Hyun that Ju Hei is almost done, and it will soon be Ju Hyun's turn. As time passed, Jay Moon had just finished preparing breakfast for everyone. Yeon finally emerges from the bedroom, yawning as he approaches the table. The kids are in their high chairs, eating on their own. Excited to see his mother, Ju Hyun encourages him to eat too. Yeon asks Ju Hyun if he wants to go to kindergarten after breakfast, and Ju Hyun expresses his enthusiasm. They're such proper kids. I mean, they do have amazing parents. After all. After the meal, the table is clear of food. The kids eagerly head out the door, with Yeon following closely behind. Ju Hei and Ju Hyun happily run outside. Yeon rushes after them, reminding them not to run or else they might fall. In the present, the twins eagerly greet their teacher by the school bus that has come to pick them up. The teacher warmly responds, affectionately calling them Ju and Ju. Yeon stands near the window, watching as the twins board the bus. They wave goodbye to their mother, prompting Ju Hyun to express concern about whether Yeon will be okay without them. Confused, Ju Hei asked Ju Hyun to clarify. He jogs her memory, reminding her of the time when their dad's pheromones hinted that their dad was in a bad mood. The twins were both alphas, so they could already tell. Sitting comfortably inside the moving bus, Juhei proposes a plan for them to prepare chocolates to cheer up their dad. Ju Hyun agrees, praising his sister for being smart. As the little ones devise an adorable solution, the reality is that there's something more serious going on between their parents. Jae Moon and Yi Yeon sit across from each other with hot tea on the table. Jay Moon initiates the conversation by asking if Yeon has been preoccupied with something lately. He recalls a recent incident when Yeon wouldn't touch him or even look in his direction after leaving the restaurant. Visibly saddened, Yeon proved Jay Moon's point by not looking him in the eyes while they talked. He confesses that he's genuinely happy Jay Moon is back. However, the mention of having another child triggered painful memories from Yeon's past pregnancy. Yeon expresses his fear that having another child might lead to Jay Moon falling sick again and this might lead to Yi on being alone once more. The thought of facing such a situation terrifies him. Hearing all of this, 
Jae Moon becomes serious and attentively listens. Yeon admits that while he is happy to see Jae Moon healthy, the memory of Jae Moon in a hospital bed haunts him. Tears well up in Yeon's eyes. Unable to witness his lover in distress, Jae Moon stands and embraces Yeon from behind, offering his apologies. Jae Moon assumes that his return might feel like a form of saving grace for Yeon, and this could be the best present he could give him. We're so happy to have you back, your highness. He confesses that he blamed himself for the pain he caused Yeon and was unaware of the depth of Yeon's sorrow if Jae Moon were to leave. Reflecting on their history, Jae Moon recalls visiting Yeon's grave in the Joseon dynasty era, recognizing that they must be going through the same pain. Jae Moon gently places a hand on Yeon's cheek and acknowledges that he fully understands why Yeon is worried and tearful. Despite the pain they've endured, Jae Moon expresses that he finds Yeon's fear endearing and lovely. He reassures Yeon that, regardless of what may come, he wants Yeon to trust him. As they share this intimate embrace with their heads close together, Jae Moon realizes that they haven't spent much time together lately. With kindness, Jae Moon asks if he can hold Yeon until his heart is full of him. Yeon responds with a playful giggle, telling him to be quiet. Yeon and Jae Moon found comfort in each other's arms. The world outside faded away as they shared whispers of love, finding warmth and comfort in the closeness of their embrace and intimate play. Communication does wonders for a relationship. Well, don't tire yourselves out like last time. As the day unfolded, Jae Moon and Yeon were actively doing the tango on the bed. Despite Yeon's plea for a pause, Jae Moon remained vibrant and enthusiastic. Eventually, exhaustion overcame Yeon, which eventually caused him to pass out. Seeing Yeon being unresponsive in bed, Jae Moon recalled the first few times they did this in the 21st century, and Yeon passed out. With a content smile, he gently lifted the now peacefully sleeping Yeon, cradling him in his arms and wished him a restful sleep. Under the orange afternoon sky, Jae Moon checks his phone for the time as he eagerly awaits his kid's return. As if on cue, the school bus arrived, and the twins were pleasantly surprised to see their dad since they were used to their mom picking them up. Having both of them in their dad's arms, the sweet kids bid farewell to the departing bus. Naturally curious, they asked their dad where their mom was, smiling. Jae Moon informed them that their mom was resting. Being as keen to detail as ever, Ju Hae detected a familiar scent on her dad. She pressed her face against her dad's chest and remarked that he smelled like their mom. Surprise! Jae Moon listened as Ju Hyun agreed, comparing the scent to candy. So Yeon smells like candy. I could see why Jae Moon couldn't get enough of him. The excited twins, oblivious to the attention they were drawing, exclaimed loudly about their parents' love and the possibility of a kiss. Uncomfortable with the sudden attention they're getting, Jae Moon tries to deflect the curious gazes by running away. He's unaware that other people are complimenting his looks and how cute his kids are. Getting away from the original crowd, Jae Moon brings himself and the twins closer to the street vendors with colorful tents. Excitedly, Jae Moon asks the kids if they'd like some fries and fish cake. Their enthusiastic response is a unanimous agreement on fish cake. Entering the bustling tent, the space is crowded with people engrossed in their own worlds. Jae Moon carefully lets the twins down. Ju Hyun is the first to hop out of his arms. While Jae Moon orders rice cakes and fish cakes, the twins are captivated by the lure of adventure. Juve points to a spot inside the tent, sparking Ju Hyun's curiosity. The duo ventures away, exploring the area outside Jae Moon's awareness as he engages with the shop lady regarding payment. Your Highness, please turn around. Where are your kids going? Occupying a table, three men can be seen enjoying their food. The taller individuals, a blonde and a redhead, are playfully fussing over a smaller man with black hair who is more engrossed in enjoying the delectable food than them. Amid the trio's conversation, the black-haired man's attention is diverted when he notices two little kids approaching with innocent smiles. With confidence, Ju Hei innocently asks the man if he likes fish cakes just like they do. On the other hand, Ju Hyun feels uneasy around strangers. He stuttered while suggesting to his sister that they should leave. Feeling flustered, the black-haired man smiles and inquires if she's talking to him. Before the twins can respond, the redhead unexpectedly grabs the black-haired man from behind and inserts himself into the conversation. Sporting a menacing smile and intimidating eyes, he warns Ju Hei that the attractive black-haired man likes him and not fish cakes. Sir, why would you pick a fight with a baby? What makes you think this is a fair fight? Ju Hei is left stunned, unable to move in response to this unexpected turn of events. Meanwhile, Ju Hyun's loud cries resonate throughout the tent, capturing everyone's attention. 
The blonde man scolds the redhead for causing a mess. But the redhead offers only excuses. Tensions escalate, and a physical confrontation seems imminent. Meanwhile, the black-haired man attempts to comfort the upset children. But just in the nick of time, Jay Moon intervenes. Exerting authority with his voice, Jay Moon demands an explanation for the commotion. The three men abruptly cease whatever they were doing to stare at Jay Moon as Ju Hyun rushes to hug his dad, seeking comfort. On the other hand, Ju Hye lingers behind, avoiding her dad's gaze. Tending to the crying Ju Hyun, Jay Moon tenderly hugged him and expressed his apologies for momentarily looking away from them. He was too busy packing up the food, and it caused him to overlook his kids not being by his side. The black-haired man bowed apologetically, unsure of why the child started crying. Ask your redhead friend over there, kind sir. Feeling a bit uneasy about the unexpected situation, Jay Moon reassured him that everything was fine and took the blame for not keeping a close eye on his children. Deciding it was time to leave, Jay Moon lifted Ju Hyun with one arm and allowed Ju Hye to walk on her own as long as she held his hand tightly. Jay Moon and the twins began to make their way out, leaving the three men behind watching them as they walked away. As the night slowly approaches, Jay Moon walks home with the kids, and the street lights begin to illuminate their path. Chu Hyun was sound asleep in Jay Moon's arms, likely overwhelmed by the events of the day, especially encountering a menacing alpha. Understanding that the day had been challenging for both of his children, Jay Moon gently asked Ju Hye to stay close to him next time, hoping to prevent any similar situations in the future. With a frown, Ju Hye genuinely apologized for what happened. Jay Moon smiles warmly as he looks down at his daughter. He gently tells her that it's time to go home now. Phew, what an eventful day. At least the kids are safe, and they get to have bonding time with their dad. What adventures would these two get themselves into next? In the middle of the morning, the family is at home. Yeon is playfully chasing Ju Hye and Ju Hyun, insisting that it's time for them to eat. Despite Yeon raising his voice to get their attention, the twins are clad in yellow shark hoodies and continue to run around. To make things more fun, they pretend that Yeon is a shark they need to avoid. In the chase, Ju Jun falls victim to Yeon's clutches, and now he has no choice but to sit down and eat. Seizing the opportunity, Ju Hye abandons her brother and flees to save herself. With Ju Hyun in his arms, Yeon admires their kid's agility, especially Ju Hye, and playfully compares her to Jae Moon. Yeon attempts to call Ju Hye by her full name, warning that he might get mad. Desperate to hide, Juve spots dad Jay Moon sitting comfortably on the couch with his pen and tablet. Will Jay Moon side with his daughter or help out his precious Yeon? She approaches him, and Jay Moon greets her with a smile, calling her General Shark. Juve pleads for her dad's help in hiding, and Jay Moon teases her, saying he doesn't want to help disobedient sharks. Flustered, Juve insists that Yeon made rice with spinach today, which justifies her running away. She promises she's not disobeying. So Jay Moon eventually agrees to hide her. He's so weak for his daughter. However, he warns that if Yeon finds her, she must eat. Jay Moon can't help but notice how much Ju Hye resembles Yeon at this moment. Jay Moon leaves Ju Hye inside a blanket, which allows her to hide underneath. However, despite Ju Hye's efforts, she's still sticking out too much. Already underneath the blanket, Ju Hye pokes her head outside and whispers to her dad, asking if he can see her. Pretending to be engrossed in his tablet, Jay Moon reassures her that he can't see her at all. Ju Hye asks again if he can see her because she really wants to hide from her mom since he's mad right now. Jay Moon continues to reassure her that Yeon's not mad and it's okay for her to get caught. Ju Hye emphasizes that she doesn't want to get caught because she doesn't like spinach. Witnessing this adorable interaction between Jay Moon and Ju Hye, Yeon can't help but have his heart melt and smile at the scene. Though he's not quite sure where Ju Hye got her information that he was making spinach rice because he wasn't. Without exchanging any words, Yeon and Jae Moon engage in a pretend act together. Yeon pretends not to know where Ju Hye is and asks Jae Moon where she went. Jae Moon giggles and replies that he doesn't know. These two are really soulmates. They can metaphorically read each other's minds. Yeon hovers around the blanket near Jae Moon and loudly announces that Ju Hye doesn't have to eat spinach anymore so she can come out. He adds that she needs to eat, wash, and go to the hot springs with Grandpa. Forgetting whether Yeon is mad or not, Ju Hye comes out of the blanket and happily asks if she really doesn't need to eat spinach anymore. Yeon opens his arms to take her in, reassuring her that she doesn't have to eat it. He invites her to eat, wash up, and put on new clothes. While holding Ju Hye in his arms, Yeon suddenly remembers that a package arrived for Jae Moon. Jae Moon mentions that the package contains the item they discussed at work. 
Yiyan was curious about what item. Covering Juhei's ears, Jae Moon whispers that they have to use the item soon. Yiyan blushes, falls silent, and suddenly has the rush of feeling nervous. Jae Moon interprets this as a sign to take Juhei away and reassures her that Yiyan is fine as long as she eats. Even though Yiyan was still absorbing the information in his head, he asked Jae Moon if he could hand over Juhei to him. Jae Moon said that he should be preserving his energy later, so that means Jae Moon can handle the kids just fine. Yeon smacks Jae Moon's shoulder and scolds him for always speaking about inappropriate stuff, especially when the children are around. Playfully, Jae Moon seeks comfort from his daughter and tells her that Yeon is being mean to him. Yeon gets grumpy and demands that Jae Moon leave the kid out of it. Mr. Ji Sea Young arrives at their house in warm clothes to pick up the kids. He opens his arms, and the kids immediately rush to hug him. Jae Moon can now call Mr. Ji Sea Young his father in law without worry, and he tells him to rest a lot and return with the kids soon. Mr. G. C. Young expresses his thanks to J. Moon for being worried and assures him that he'll have a nice vacation, calling J. Moon his son-in-law endearingly. What character development? Right before they left, Ju Hei and Ju Hyun waved their tiny goodbyes to their parents. With Mr. G. C. Young and the kids out of the doors, the parents watch as Mr. G. C. Young refers to the kids as his puppies, and the three happily go on their way outside the house. This prompts the couple to close their doors. Now that the kids are gone, Yeon and Jae Moon find themselves with the time and space to engage in physical activities without worrying about noise or someone looking. They could even use the item from the package. They finally have the freedom to enjoy some private moments together. Yeon admits that though he misses Jae Moon's touches, he's still concerned that he might get pregnant. Jae Moon reminds him that he already took his medication to prevent pregnancy, so he shouldn't worry at all. Yeon is enjoying his time in Jae Moon's arms, but since they are on the topic of pregnancy, he starts wondering when the last time Jae Moon was in a rut. Looking back at his lover, he notices a sinister look on Jae Moon's face. With a smile, Jae Moon reassures him not to worry or be upset. Oh no, could Yeon's suspicions be accurate? In the soft glow of the room, the couple's warmth and the rhythm of their breathing create a quiet symphony of intimacy as their bodies were fitting together like pieces of a perfect puzzle. Jae Moon is overwhelmed with a surge of affection for Yeon. Every glance, touch, and shared moment intensifies the warmth within him. Fueled by affection, Jae Moon bites Yeon on the back of his neck. Caught off guard, Yeon's eyes widened in astonishment. He asked Jae Moon if he had marked him. A delicate black dragon, seemingly sketched with the finesse of a calligraphy pen, adorns the back of Yeon's neck. Jae Moon expresses that they forged an unbroken connection, merging their hearts into one, and observes that their pheromones now share similarities. As he says this, the sweet aroma of their mingling pheromones envelops the couple. In the heat of the moment, Yeon expresses his readiness and eagerness to embrace the prospect of welcoming another life into the world. Choosing the comfort of rest, the couple drifts into a peaceful slumber wrapped in each other's warm embrace. Upon entering the realm of dreams with the mark left by Jae Moon on the back of his neck, Yeon found that his once ominous world, where everything reigned around him, had transformed. In their cozy house, Jae Moon and Yeon find themselves on their bed, smiles lighting up their faces as they flip through Yeon's photo album. Yeon's eyes linger on the pages, reminiscing about the school festivals he used to attend every year. Just by the neighborhood and a short 30-minute bus ride away, the venue holds a special place in his memories. Intrigued by the thought, Jae Moon suggests they might have crossed paths during those school days. Yeon, however, expresses that that would have been impossible. Curiosity sparking, Jae Moon questions why Yeon dismisses the possibility. In response, Yeon tenderly embraces Jae Moon, revealing a little-known detail from his past. He confesses that he used to wear glasses but underwent laser eye surgery to correct his vision. The memory of the joy he felt upon seeing clearly without glasses floods back. Yeon explains that he had thick eyeglasses once framing his face, so it would have been impossible for Jae Moon to recognize him. Confident in his ability to remember faces, Jae Moon expresses regret at not having known this detail earlier. He asserts that, had he known, he would have surely remembered Yeon's face from their school days. I need an alternate universe with these two being in school and falling in love. In a moment of sharing their history, Yeon reveals that he believes the first time he met Jae Moon was at the train station. Good times, even before knowing his name, Jae Moon was convinced he had a thing for Yeon. Jae Moon smiles and glances back, expressing his conviction that Yeon was like a cat, moving effortlessly from one location to another. Yeon recollects that that meeting most likely occurred before his heat manifested. This must have been the day when Jae Moon quite literally carried him away to safety. 
With his face buried in his lover's broad shoulders, Yeon flipped through the pages of the photo album and saw a familiar face. Yeon leans in with curiosity written on his face and questions whether the individual with slicked back hair, dressed formally and exuding handsomeness, is Secretary Kong or merely someone who bears a striking resemblance. Jay Moon confirms with certainty and states that it is indeed Secretary Kong. He shares that Secretary Kong was a senior during their school days. Surprise, Yeon remarks that Secretary Kong must have graduated earlier, but Yeon insists that the album he possesses is from their third year. Puzzled, he wonders why Secretary Kong would be present in the album. Jay Moon explains that it's a tradition for graduated students to return each year, either to volunteer or simply enjoy time with current students. The couple stares at Secretary Kong's picture. The picture was taken only a few years ago. In that small snippet of the past, Secretary Kong busied himself with assisting at some of the school booths, particularly overseeing prize distributions. School girls would approach him excitedly to claim their prizes. It looks like he's popular. Around 12.30, Secretary Kong took a break, enjoying a sandwich and complimentary plum tea. Seated beside him was a girl in a blue tracksuit who noted the increased participation in the festival. She expressed gratitude for his assistance, acknowledging their booze need for support. In reality, Secretary Kong volunteered not just for the festival but with a deeper purpose, which was to reunite with someone he sorely missed. Sensing his sentiments, the observant girl questioned if he was searching for someone specific. Secretary Kong preferred to keep it private. Look at him being all shy. I wonder who could be causing him to react like this. Unexpectedly, a guy with brown hair and thick glasses interrupted their conversation. He was presenting a package with a wide smile. She yawned in thick glasses. This is a rare sight to see. The girl knew what it was and asked if it was the stamps she had been waiting for. The guy with thick glasses confirmed and cheerfully mentioned his plans to be present at the next year's festival, prompting a cheer from the girl at the idea of meeting again. While the two were stuck in a conversation, Secretary Kong was lost in his thoughts and felt a peculiar sensation, prompting him to gaze toward a specific part of the school. He abruptly stood up, citing a need to use the bathroom, and the girl encouraged him to go ahead. Secretary Kong strolled through the picturesque scenery of the school, contemplating the whereabouts of the person he had been searching for. He pondered on what this individual might be doing. It had been a considerable amount of time since this person last appeared before him since his graduation. At that point, Secretary Kong was convinced that he would gradually forget about this person in the course of this life. Secretary Kong moved through the halls, retracing the familiar pathways where the third-year students would typically be during class hours. He arrived at the door of the third year, fourth class. Is the person you like in this class? Despite uncertainty about why, Secretary Kong felt an undeniable determination not to let go of the connection he had with this person. At that moment, while Secretary Kong was fixated on the door, it suddenly swung open. A student with intense red eyes stood in front of him and appeared smaller than Secretary Kong. Young Mean, hold on. Reuniting like this implies their destined soulmates. The surprise was mutual as they locked eyes. The student was puzzled by the presence of Secretary Kong but refrained from asking for his name and politely requested to pass through. The student moved past Secretary Kong effortlessly, yet an inexplicable chill lingered in the air as he departed. Secretary Kong couldn't shake the memory. It stood out vividly in his mind. The name Jay Wayung echoed in his thoughts. Jay Wayung is this Wayung gun. As he gazed at his open palm, he clenched it into a fist with a silent vow to remember his past and embrace his role as a phoenix, which is to persist and ensure the preservation of all. A deep yearning for Jay Wayung settled within him. In the men's bathroom, Secretary Kong intervened to rescue Young Mean from imminent danger. A confrontation happened, which required Secretary Kong to take forceful measures to remove the threat. This showcases the complex and cruel destiny that was woven into their love story. Discovering Young Mean trembling in a corner, Secretary Kong emitted his calming blue pheromones as he cautiously approached the now unconscious figure. He observed the sadness etched on Young Mean's resting face and felt a pang of sympathy for him. Taking Young Mean into his protective embrace, Secretary Kong spoke to Young Mean's unconscious form and asked if his actions were providing comfort. Reflecting on the past, Secretary Kong remarked that Young Mean hadn't changed from their previous life in the Joseon Dynasty era and recalled a time when Young Mean bore the name Wa Young Gun. In hindsight, Secretary Kong grappled with guilt over his past actions, regretted his harshness, and acknowledged his own foolishness. They had once shared both affection and pain reaching a point where Secretary Kong believed it was the conclusion of their love story. However, driven by arrogance and recklessness, 
Secretary Kong resisted his destiny. His relentless pursuit of power and strength overshadowed his care for Young Min at that time. No, Young Min suffered so much, even in his past life. Ultimately, consequences caught up with Secretary Kong, and he was given a punishment for his actions. Witnessing Young Min's passing in their previous life and not being able to see Young Min for such a long time left a void in Secretary Kong's heart. Secretary Kong, recognizing his deep yearning for Young Min, now desires not only his presence but also his love. Accepting that Young Min couldn't recall their shared history, Secretary Kong found comfort in his own memories. Secretary Kong sincerely wished for a future where they would cross paths again. In the past, Young Min managed to recall Secretary Kong's pheromones, although his eyes were closed and his body weakened. Unable to see his rescuer's face, he could only grasp onto the recognition that these pheromones belonged to an Omega, and the scent held a certain familiarity for him. And so starts his obsession with trying to find the pheromones. A few years down the road, Secretary Kong and Young Min coincidentally crossed paths by literally bumping into each other. Despite their eyes meeting, Young Min failed to recognize Secretary Kong and continued walking away. However, Secretary Kong smiled at the unexpected encounter with Young Min. Formerly restricted to facing forward, Secretary Kong now had the chance to walk behind. Young Min and observe everything around him. This marked the beginning of a new chapter in their relationship. You have a lot of years to make up for. This also explains why he specifically works closely with Jay Moon. Speaking of Jay Moon, what's Jay Moon his family up to these days? In the bathroom, Yeon holds a pregnancy test indicating a positive result. As time passes, he finds a comfortable spot to sit but a sad expression takes over his face while he uses his phone. I hope everything's okay. Meanwhile, in the middle of the afternoon at the Jam Mart Gallery, Jay Moon happily answers a call. His mood shifts from joy to concern as he senses something wrong with Yeon's voice. Jay Moon asks if Yeon is crying. Sobbing hard, Yeon struggles to articulate his words. Jay Moon got worried and asked Yeon where he was at the moment. With his head bowed to his knees, Yeon requests for mandarins. This stops Jay Moon in his tracks, recalling that Yeon doesn't like that fruit. Yeon explains that despite his aversion, the third baby seems to crave them. He pleads with Jay Moon not to make the same mistake and bring oranges again. In the lit parking lot, Jay Moon carefully swings open his car door and promises Yeon not to bring oranges this time. Yeon begs him to drive carefully. While driving, Jay Moon shares words of reassurance with Yeon while also mentioning their two current kids, the dragons. This sparks Yeon to open up about a dream that has been haunting him. With a hint of vulnerability, he asks if he remembers the unsettling nightmare he had previously shared, which involved the recurring image of a dragon. Yeon moves on to elaborate and confesses that he encountered the same mystical dragon once more. Curious, Jae Moon asks whether it's the dream where the dragon weaves tears of blood, referring to Yeon as its mother. Tears stream down Yeon's face as he opens up. Yeon reveals that the dragon appearing in his dreams is none other than their lost child, Huang, from their past life. Longing colors his words as Yeon emphasizes that this dragon was meant to be their firstborn. Stuck in traffic, Jay Moon takes a moment to absorb this information. He is overwhelmed with the realization that he is going to have his son back. Tears of joy stream down his face as he gazes at the happy look on Yeon's caller ID picture. Tears of joy cascade down Jay Moon's face as he asks Yeon if he needs anything else. Yeon shifts from being serious to flashing a smile on his face as he insists that he doesn't need anything more. However, the unborn baby expresses a desire to feel the presence of their father, which prompts Yeon to caress his stomach lovingly. Determined, Jae Moon declares that he's heading home. Before ending the call, Yeon expresses his love for Jae Moon. Alone in his car, Jae Moon's tears continue to flow, which compels him to cover half his face. Reflecting on his past, he made up his mind not to let sadness infiltrate his family again. Armed with a bag of mandarins, Jay Moon safely reaches home, finding Yeon happily seated on the couch. Yeon is safe and happy. Jay Moon is home on time. I love this family so much. At that moment, Jay Moon solemnly swears to love and protect Yeon from any danger. The memories of Yeon's passing, the weight of his lifeless body in Jay Moon's arms, and the painful act of burying him resurface in Jay Moon's mind. He vows to shield him from the profound pain of loss and to spare himself from undergoing that heart-wrenching feeling again. Yeon rises from the couch and wraps his arms around his lover. Although Jay Moon recognizes the echoes of their past, he is now determined to leave it all behind and treat it as a dream he wishes to forget. Jay Moon's hands gently rest on Yeon's stomach as he makes a heartfelt promise to be by their side forever. 
overwhelmed with emotion. Tears escape from Jay Moon's eyes as he affectionately refers to their baby as beautiful. In a tender moment, Jay Moon and Yeon share a sweet kiss, their embrace continuing with heartfelt confessions of love for each other. And the air is filled with the warmth of their connection and the shared promise of a future together. As time passes, Yeon's stomach expands, evidence of the growing life within. Anticipating the arrival of their baby, Jay Moon joins in the excitement by searching for baby clothes together. They spend moments watching movies, sharing laughter, and sleeping with Jay Moon's hand gently hovering over Yeon's growing belly. One day, they decide to explore painting together, attempting to depict a green dragon. Jay Moon playfully teases Yeon and insists that Yeon's creation resembles a snake more than a dragon. Slightly grumpy, Yeon asserts that it is indeed a dragon. Jay Moon chuckles and compliments the painting's beauty while repeating that it still resembles a snake. Also suddenly, the mood shifts when Yeon experiences unbearable pain. Trying to call for Jay Moon, he finds himself ignored as Jay Moon is absorbed in his painting. He says that the paintings don't matter if they're accurate or not as long as he gets to meet his son. In the middle of Jay Moon's oblivious bliss, Yeon crouches in agony and struggles to endure the pain. Still unaware of the distress, Jay Moon questions if his painting is beautiful. However, he has yet to receive a response. Curious, Jay Moon turns around, looking for Yeon, and suggests hanging the paintings in the baby's room. Unfortunately, Jay Moon's peaceful bliss turns to shock and worry when he notices Yeon on the floor. Unconscious, panic sets in, and he screams Yeon's name. The joyous atmosphere was shattered by the sudden turn of events. No, Yeon, you have to be okay. Please wake up. In their house, Yeon collapses onto the floor. The remnants of their painting session created unintended artistic chaos on the floor with spilled water, diluted green paint, and scattered brushes. As Yeon appears increasingly unwell, Jae Moon is taken aback by the sudden turn of events and finds himself momentarily powerless to respond. With urgency, Jae Moon manages to get Yeon to the hospital. Alone, he waits outside the operating room, his head in his hands, consumed by thoughts of Yeon and their unborn baby. The tense atmosphere is interrupted by hurried steps approaching Jay Moon. Looking disheveled and concerned, his parents and Mr. G. C. Young ask about what happened to Yeon. Jay Moon wears a serious expression and explains that Yeon fainted suddenly. He also added that Jay Moon completed the hospitalization procedures an hour ago while Yeon was taken to the operating room. Jay Moon's mother maintains a calm demeanor and suggests the baby might arrive a week earlier than expected. Considering this is Yeon's second Susurian section, she emphasizes the need for Yeon to replenish energy. As the operating room doors open, a nurse emerges, announcing that it's time to cut the umbilical cord. Is this a successful birth? Please tell me Yeon's okay too. Now in green scrubs, masked and gloved up, Jay Moon entered the operating room. The medical staff congratulates him on the birth of his son and informs him that Yeon has delivered a healthy baby boy, so it's time to cut the umbilical cord which Jay Moon successfully did. Tears of joy stream down Jay Moon's face as he is presented with his newborn son, carefully placed on a towel. The newborn doesn't cry and lies peacefully with a tiny arm outstretched. Finally, Jay Moon meets his son and tenderly touches the tip of the baby's finger. Congratulations, Jay Moon. Outside Yeon's hospital room, a nameplate proudly bears his name. Inside, Yeon rests in bed, an IV connected to him. While beside him, Jay Moo gently holds Yeon's hand and gives it tender kisses. With a warm smile on his face, Jay Moon affectionately urges Yeon to wake up, his hopeful words fill in the quiet hospital room. The hospital room door swings open, and the twins rush in with their faces lighting up as they enthusiastically greet their dad. Following closely behind them is Jay Moon's mom. Overjoyed, Jay Moon welcomes them with open arms, cautioning the twins to keep their voices down as Yeon is still asleep. With a soft smile, Jay Moon's mom requests that he take the kids to see their new little brother. With eyes wide and mouths agape in awe, Ju Hyun and Ju Hei eagerly ask their dad if they can meet their sibling. Jay Moon happily agrees to grant the twins a glimpse of their baby brother. Inside the nursery, the third baby was swaddled in a towel and gently carried by a medical staff member. Outside, Ju Hyun and Ju Hei peer in. Ju Hyun comments on how tiny the baby is, while Ju Hei observes that the newborn looks as red as Ju Hyun does when he cries. This prompts a grumpy response from Ju Hyun, who questions Ju Hei about her remark. In playful retaliation, Ju Hei sticks her tongue out at her twin, asserting that he was once a baby, too. Jae Moon joins in the laughter, 
rubbing the twins' hair and enveloping them in a hug from behind. He declares that their family now consists of five members. Curious, Zhu Hyun asks Jae Moon about the baby's name. Beaming with pride, Jae Moon announces that the newborn is named Jae Ju Hyuk. Thrilled for Jae Moon, Eon and he have been through a lot, but it looks like brighter days are coming. Two weeks later, the trees blossom with flowers and fresh leaves. In the living room, Ju Hyun and Ju Hae are dressed in adorable orange oversized sweaters and are hovering over Ju Hyuk. Observing the baby, Ju Hae notices Ju Hyuk's sharp nose. Ju Hyun remarks that Ju Hyuk resembles their dad, while Ju Hae points out that the baby shares the same eyes as their mom. On the couch, the parents were having a good time watching over their kids. Yeon leans over Jae Moon, Jae Moon's arm around his shoulder. Yeon chuckles with Jae Moon as Jae Moon suggests the twins might like Ju Hyuk. Yeon agrees and reminisces about how small Ju Hae and Ju Hyun once were. Hugging Jae Moon, Yeon expresses his happiness when he woke up on his hospital bed and found Jae Moon by his side. He shared that having Jae Moon there was comforting and that it allowed him to sleep well. Becoming a bit grumpy, Jae Moon admits he was terrified that there might have been a chance Yeon wouldn't wake up after an hour of anesthesia. In response, Yeon laughs and remembers how Jae Moon called for a nurse while shedding tears. Sulking, Jae Moon turns to his husband and attempts to express his worries, but Yeon continues laughing. Jae Moon continues to be a green flag. Yeon, stop teasing your hubby. Suddenly, Ju Hyuk starts crying. Jae Moon acts fast, immediately knows what the baby needs, and decides to give the little one some milk. Patted on the head, Yeon expresses gratitude for Jae Moon taking over the task. Determined, Jae Moon grabs the milk and tests its temperature by dripping a bit on the back of his hand. He assures that the milk is just right. Now in the living room, Jae Moon sits on the living room floor with crossed legs, cradles Ju Hyuk, and feeds him from a bottle, urging him to eat well. Fascinated, Ju Hyun joins Jae Moon and asks if he can feel Ju Hyuk. Jae Moon laughs and questions Ju Hyun if he really wants to try it by himself. Meanwhile, Ju Hae approaches her mom. Yeon fixes Ju Hae's hair and gladly invites her onto his lap. He asks if she wants to try feeding the baby, but Ju Hae looks tired and opts to rest. She proceeds to lay her head on her mom's lap, prompting Yeon to encourage her to sleep. During the afternoon, Ju Hyun peacefully drifts off to sleep in his bed in the center of the living room. At the same time, Jae Moon cradles Ju Kyuk and sways gently while standing, coaxing the little one to sleep. When Jae Moon senses that Ju Hyuk has drifted into sleep, he carefully places him back in his bed. Spotting Yeon asleep, Jae Moon covers him with a warm blanket. Close by, Ju Hae has drifted off to sleep next to her twin, inadvertently bothering Ju Hyun's face. Though Ju Hyun is asleep, he doesn't seem bothered enough to wake up and protest. Observing his beautiful family, Jae Moon smiles with contentment. He cherishes this spring and couldn't be happier. This spring, Jae Moon observes that the plum blossoms have bloomed early. The family welcomed Ju Hyuk, and today turned out well for Jae Moon's family, wishing them more happy days ahead. The room pulsates with an eerie red glow, casting an unsettling atmosphere. At the entrance, claws emerge, and inhumanly shaped legs extend outward. A malevolent growl echoes through the room. In the safety of his room, a man wearing an orange jacket screams, his eyes shielded from the monitor and headphones tightly secured. The horror game he's playing has him on edge, and fear grips him intensely. Thank goodness it was only a game. Abruptly, his mood takes a sharp turn as a notification reveals a generous donation. The message referred to him as Sun, and asked if he was scared while also praising his streaming abilities. The donation is a whopping 500,000 won. The streamer, known as Lord God in the streaming world, is not treated like a deity by his chat. Instead, they laugh questioning if the donor is his parent and teasing him about his flushed face. Some find him cute, while others focus on the substantial donation. The streamer clarifies that his mom did make the generous contribution and reveals that, despite playing a horror game, he wasn't scared at all. All men do is lie, I see. A beaming smile braces his face as he promises to show off his parents live next time. Another notification pops up, and it carries a message reminding him to go to the movies at 10 p.m., Flustered and trembling from embarrassment, the streamer covers most of his face with his hand. The chat reacts with laughter, teasingly suggesting the reminder must be from a lover while also pointing out how he was so flustered this time. Meanwhile, in the chat, some people try to clarify that this streamer currently lives with his brother, so this message must not be from a lover. He and his brother must be close because he could just drop a message like that. Eventually, 
The streamer emerges from his room, slams the door open, and angrily shouts Jeju Hyuk's name aloud. Jeju Hyuk, is this streamer talking about the baby? A man with broad shoulders, light brown hair, and an emotionless expression looks at his phone while sitting on the couch. He addresses the streamer as his lovely brother and asks him what he needs from him. The streamer is fuming with anger and demands that Ju Hyuk not call him that. Ju Hyuk discloses that if their sister hears him talking this way, then she'll surely be upset. Thoughts of their sister send chills down the streamer's spine, making him feel really scared. The sister has black hair and a scary smile like Jae Moon that could only mean the streamer is Ju Hyun. Ju Hyuk instructs Ju Hyun to hurry and get dressed, emphasizing that they have only 40 minutes left. Curious, Ju Hyun asks if Ju Hyuk is already prepared to head out. Ju Hyuk scratches the back of his neck and says that he's ready and comfortable going out with his current outfit. Watching his brother closely, Ju Hyun observes Ju Hyuk's slightly flustered demeanor and tendency to avoid eye contact. He then contrasts his brother's appearance with their confident dad, Jae Moon, which annoys him. Someone, please give Ju Hyun a pat on the back. Despite being somewhat annoyed by the resemblance, Ju Hyun compliments his brother nonetheless. Ju Hyun and Ju Hyuk successfully make it to the cinema and begin searching for their sister. Ju Hyuk points out that she hasn't arrived yet. Ju Hyun speculates that she might have forgotten their plans and overslept. However, the boys quickly notice something behind them. Ju Hyun sighs and questions their sister about what she's trying to do. Ju Hyuk catches her while Ju Vei leans toward him. She appears annoyed and tired, with her head and shoulder hung low. Ju Hyun suggests that she should have told them if she needed to reschedule. Chubet explains that not everything was her fault, but she did forget to save a file, which led to a lot of extra work on her end. Radiating positivity to shift the mood, Ju Hyuk offers to buy tickets and popcorn while the twins wait. As Ju Hyuk handles the tickets, Ju Hei and Ju Hyun sit nearby and chat. Ju Vei asks Ju Hyun what he's doing today, and he tells her if he tried to tell her he's going home after his stream and a movie date. Ju Vei is glad to hear this and recommends they all go home together after the movie. Observing Ju Hyuk buying popcorn, Ju Hyun compliments his broad back and expresses that he's jealous over the fact that the good genes went to him. This prompted Ju Hei to look back at the past and recalls carrying Ju Hyuk as a baby. However, when discussing growing up, Ju Hei playfully teases Ju Hyun about when he'll stop crying. Getting grumpy, Ju Hyun points a finger at her and asks if she's playing a game right now. Echoing her twin's energy, Ju Hei grabs his finger and playfully challenges him. She advises Ju Hyun not to make their mom worry like before because of his crying. She encouraged him to resemble their baby brother more. Ju Hei clearly hit the nail on the coffin because Ju Hyun got even more pissed off. Witnessing the twins' banter, Ju Hyuk remains unfazed and unbothered, which means he's so used to them doing this all the time. Carrying the food, Ju Hyuk interrupts them and suggests that they should go in now. Ju Hei rises, affectionately grabs the back of Ju Hyuk's neck, and suggests that she should sit next to him. Holding the popcorn for Ju Hyuk, she witnesses Ju Hyun swiftly hugging their little brother while he casts an intimidating glare and reminds her that Ju Hyuk is his sibling. Caught in the middle, Ju Hyuk is a part of the ongoing banter between the twins. I know they're fighting, but can we take a minute to thank Yan and Jae Mood for their good genes and hard work? Ju Hyun compliments Ju Hyuk for buying plenty of popcorn for all of them, while Ju Hei asks if it's caramel flavored. The twins assert that they will both enjoy the popcorn. The banter continues as the twins playfully tug at Ju Hyuk's shirt. Ju Hyuk recalls them doing the same thing when he was in primary school and feels exasperated with their antics. Jae Ju Hyuk is suffering from success. The siblings arrive at their parents' home, and Yeon gasps and expresses surprise as he looks at Ju Hyuk. Confused, Jae Moon questions them about whether they actually watched a movie today. Wearing a serious expression and a flashy, fancy suit, Ju Hyuk declares to their parents that he intends to take revenge on his own siblings for putting him in this situation. Unfazed, the older siblings appear proud and happy as they act ignorant of what Ju Hyuk is trying to say. We need to see more of their sibling dynamic. Back in the movie house, Ju Huck discovered his shirt was completely torn, exposing his toned chest and abs. The twins were definitely unaware of their own strength and stared at the mess they had created. In a fit of anger, Ju Huck emitted his pheromones to accentuate his frustration, stating that he had forgotten how obsessed his siblings could be, even more so than with the movie they were supposed to watch. In a hurry, the twins dashed in one direction. Both did not want to be stuck with their pissed-off little brother and promised Ju Hyuk that they would fetch him new clothes. They instructed him to wait for them in the bathroom. In the present, 
At their parents' home, Ju Hyun pleads with a smile and brings out all the new clothes he bought for Ju Hyuk as his form of apology. Despite still being annoyed, Ju Kuk sighs and asks his parents how he looks in a suit. Yeon and Jae Moon burst into laughter, with Yeon even holding his stomach. The couple recalls a similar incident from their children's preschool days. Yeon hugs Jae Moon's arm, reminiscing about the preschool festival where Ju Hyun and Ju Hae ripped Ju Hyuk's clothes off backstage. Ju Hyun was dressed as an angel, and Ju Hae was dressed as the devil but left Ju Hyuk crying and shirtless because they ripped his clothes in half. Yeon notes that the twins managed to find an alternative outfit for Ju Hyuk, but the substitute outfit was a B costume typically worn by girls. Yeon and Jae Moon laugh at their own baby boy more than the rest of the crowd. Yeon even video recorded that moment. Yeon and Jae Moon gushed that Ju Hyuk looked so cute at that time. They remember Ju Hyuk going on stage all alone and was very angry when he yelled that someone was going to pay for what happened to him. Back in the present, Yeon and Jae Moon were still laughing a lot at the memory. Yeon remembers that even the speaker was laughing a lot, filled with happiness and affection. Yeon requests to hug all his babies. Without hesitation, the siblings immediately envelop their mother in a tight hug. At the same time, Jae Moon embraces them all from the outside. At that moment, Yeon senses a change in the air. Their once tiny, warm, and loving hands have grown but continue to hold onto his, now warmer than ever. Yeon cherishes the fact that all these kids have grown up and amidst shared expressions of love, the family basks in the warmth of their bond. And core, and core. What a ride. Yeon and Jae Moon faced challenges in their past lives and in the present, but ultimately, they were able to achieve a lot and were blessed with three beautiful children.